studied illustration and design in college um, and got into filmmaking anim- you know, through animation and, and doing old-fashioned special effect optical printing stuff. Um, and then, you know, I ha- always had an interest in theater, so my, my design and theater, you know, curiosities began to merge, and I was doing illustration assignments uh, with performances, and I was doing theater by making weird props and wearing them, and so um, I started to, I, I started out as a regular actor, in, you know, in, in, in theater productions, and uh, being the artist in the crew, I would be asked to make the unusual props or costume pieces, and sometimes performing them. And the experience of um, coming on stage and feeling instant focus, you know, feeling the audience like watching and suddenly noticing this is unusual. Um, my first production like that was I, I played a giant lobster in a production of Sam Shepard's Cowboy Mouth, and. After being in all these plays and having to earn the love of the audience, to walk out and instantly have it, and then the challenge was to like, don't disappoint them. Do something interesting with it. <clears throat> and in the review, I mean, in the review, it mentioned the lobster. I mean, immediately I got my first like mention. You know, uh, I thought like, there's a power to this. You know, to making art that moves, that's time-based. You know, that's part of a living experience where someone can say. I saw that sculpture in motion in this year. I'll never forget the night I was out with this person. We encountered it in this place. I turned around and it startled me. And then it proceeded to do this. And then it almost got hit by a bus. There was an argument and then it ran off into the distance. You know, this is all part of the artwork. Once again, it's my love of context. There's all these different contexts that are being created because the artwork isn't in the gallery wall. And it was a great way for me to sidestep that whole uncomfortable sort of gallery system or artists for just the elite who understand and appreciate and buy art, but making art that can be enjoyed by the public. And so I was instantly interested in parades, circuses, street performers, um, street art. I mean, anybody who was doing it where it could be seen for free or for very little um, got me into the world of street performing. So that happened accidentally. and. Um, It's interesting that I'm in Italy right now in Torino uh, because I formed my company, Big Nazo Lab, um, by doing street theater in Europe. And when I got into Italy, when I got, when I arrived in Italy, because I speak some Italian, um, I was able to kind of use English, Italian, and the physical theater I'd been doing while I was in France, where I spoke no French. It all kind of came together. You know, I wasn't completely fluent in the Italian, so I could use some words that draw people in. Um, but I was definitely like this foreigner, you know, this as a creature as well. And what happened was that I was just out in public. I would I would duck behind bushes, like just like a superhero, hide my passport and stuff under like a shrub, suit up, and just walk around like Notre Dame Cathedral, like you know, in the park out there, or Centre Pompidou. But in Italy, I was in Verona or you know, Padova, just different cities. And the piazzas at night have this great street life, you know, where people are just out for la caminata. You know, they're out to just walk around and meet each other before or after dinner. And I um, found such a receptive, warm audience. It probably wouldn't have happened in the States. I would have been judging myself too harshly. But these audiences were very receptive. And they were like, hey, naso, naso, grande naso. They were basically saying, hey, big nose, because the character had this big nose. It's got right here on my shirt. And what happened was that money was being tossed. At the time it was Lira. And I was like having money thrown at me and I had to find something to put it in. And then suddenly I was like earning money, you know, by being a creature in public. And the idea of traveling changed. It was like, hey, I was gigging. I was doing like a job. I was on tour. And then I started to meet other performers who didn't have the visual draw but had music. So I met these guys who were playing like like traditional ancient medieval instruments like lutes doing re- renaissance music and we formed a show together where we started doing rock and roll music with medieval instruments this giant puppet MC and we doubled our crowds and we're making tons of you know I mean pretty good money and soon we were given free accommodations we were invited to parties people were giving us food we were like um, troubadours you know people wanted us to show up at their plays they wanted to show off these cool people they met so the experience of doing this kind of gave me an idea of how I wanted to live. 
you know, I had transformed uh, the fragile existence of being a foreigner traveling uh, to becoming sort of a star who was an attraction in another culture, but accepted by that culture, and, and also at the same time bringing something very unusual to it. But it was accepted, and, interest, and people were interested in it. So when I got back to the U.S., I um, you know, I mean, I'm really cutting corners here, but I mean, long story short, I wanted to preserve that experience. So I started doing street theater in Providence, where I was based at the time, and still am, and uh, would go to Boston and New York as well, and you know, Washington Square Park or Faneuil Hall, and um, continued doing street performances, and then eventually formed a rock band, um, and then we were playing nightclubs, and then you know, stage shows, and then um, at uh, just our reputation was increasing by word of mouth and um, basically the way the whole company formed there was no business plan and there was really no path it was opportunities came sequentially we solved uh, we, we approached the challenges and were stepped into a new arena a new playing field so every time we were asked to do something we hadn't done before um, I remember our first corporate business performance, you know, where we were doing live video feed and it was very abstract and odd to us. And once we did that, we could say we did corporate parties and then got hired and paid better. And at the same time, though, we, our, street, our roots were like avant-garde, uh, you know, strange, twisted street performance, carnival arts. We traveled a lot with, uh, you know, we hung out with sword swallowers and fire eaters and contortionists. I'm not exaggerating. I mean, these are, this is the crowd we ran with. So, I mean, I, that's basically, that's, how I got to where I am now is that it's been um, a series of uh, of sort of good and bad luck, you know, all mixed together. I mean, there's been tons of uh, almosts for our company where we could have been, uh, you know, uh, achieved a certain level of success in a certain playing field, but the cards just weren't there in terms of some television opportunities, which we'll get another chance to do, I think, and will be better prepared. Um, and then also the incredible luck where just, uh, you know, the phone just rings and if someone has heard from somebody and they just want to see a reel and wow, that one person saw us and just talked about us to someone. It was like a little viral spread where, you know, they got off a plane and just mentioned us and someone did the research and contacted us and that's how we did our first gigs in Japan. You know, performing in for me in Japan for us was a real big thing because it you know we just went to the other side of the world and we just you know we're in this completely different culture and it helped us define even more how we wanted to explore that awkwardness of like being completely foreign not I mean, not speaking the language not being able to read even the characters you know the alphabet and our shows are all about that our performances are about being creatures being misfits being human hybrids who don't belong but find a way and then we start to real and we make the audiences realize that they're just like our characters that it, we're just physically manifesting and exaggerating you know the things that everyone feels you know in their own lives yeah being at view has been amazing i mean uh i mean i've been busy doing stuff i've been doing workshops with kids in, in a local school uh did a workshop early this afternoon with uh college age students and some of the professionals here at the, at the conference uh, and I've also been just going to everything I can you know soaking it up it's been such a great education and um, it's fantastic to you know in some cases getting reinforcement about things I already feel and know about the industry and in other cases just seeing it all deconstructed for me understanding stuff that I took for granted or that I've always wondered about and you know the most amazing part though is is meeting the you know the people who are you know the magicians you know the the ones who are the practitioners the technicians the ones who create these uh, you know, sort of our communal illusions our dreams you know uh, a lot of the films that I've seen the effects deconstructed at this uh, conference are films I you know I saw in the movie theater and I watched them and had reactions and you know about them and to sort of see it um, all again, but in a more informal way. It's awesome, it's very empowering, and it makes the world see it feel a little smaller. Um, it doesn't take away the magic at all, it just makes you realize um, that in the end it's just
people, you know, the, the little tiny organisms that we are, you know, when you think of how si the size of the planet, um, just how much an individual, working with a team of individuals, can, can create to collectively, you know, um, produce a giant dream that others all over the world sit in a darkened room or in a, you know, in front of their console or their computer and, and are transported into this vision. It's just, it's, it's helped me stay completely fascinated and alert and appreciative of the, of the filmmaking process. It doesn't do what you'd imagine, which is to sort of take away the mystery. It makes you appreciate the way that we all collaborate in creating mysteries that we love, you know, that cre we create these living dreams and we, we allow ourselves to go there, you know, to just be transported. So, but the food has been amazing. I mean, being in Italy and being in Torino, and I've never been in Torino before, has been awesome. Just walking through the streets, you know, it's just, it's uplifting. And every day I think to myself how incredibly happy I am to be here. I mean, I'm, I'm not joking. I'm like, wow, I'm really going to, I'm living to the fullest right now. And um, I don't know if a lot of conferences a person would say that, you know. Being in a conference, I mean, you spend a lot of time in the center. Um, but to me, it's just been magic because it's the right proportion of human interactions uh, at the hotel, on the streets, at the communal dinners, where you just feel like you're making great friends, you're learning about other lives, and you're... De the things are being demystified for you, but at the same time, new myths are being created, new awe is being created. Um, and then there's just like technically being in a room and being taught something. Uh, and it's like, it's like being in a, a temple, you know? I mean, I've often felt, and I, I'm not alone in this, that, you know, films and theater are sort of the new temple. You know, this is where we kind of go to contemplate the universe and host new ideas and we're open to like how how could we be what could happen what are different ideas and so it's great to meet the high priests and priestesses of this profession so I'm just it's just awesome great time